Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Stephen Bornstein. I'm the director of the Newfoundland and Labrador Center for Applied Health Research, which henceforth will be known as the center, because it's easier that way. Uh, we are the host of 15 or 16 research exchange groups, of which this is one. This is our rural northern aboriginal uh, health research exchange group, as those of you in the room and many of you on the phone uh, are aware. Uh, and we're delighted to have as a special presentation today uh, Dr. Trevor Bell. Uh, Dr. Bell uh, is a professor in the Department of Geography at MUN. He's also a university research professor, which sounds like we're all university research professors, but we're not. It actually has capital letters and is an extremely rare and highly coveted designation, which among other things gets you off a lot of teaching obligations <laughs> over a number of years. Um, he has been working on Arctic landscape history for over three decades, which means he must dye his hair. Um, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> uh, he's played an important role in one of Canada's networks of centers of excellence, the one called ArcticNet. He has been a co-author of an important chapter in the Government of Canada's 2016 publication entitled Canada's Marine Coasts in a Changing Climate, uh, which is one of his uh, predominant interests. He is also a leader of the recent development of an initiative called Smart Ice about uh, safer travel for sea ice users. And he's a founding member and leader of an organization called CATCHON, which is C-A-C-C-O-N, which stands for the Circumarctic Coastal Communities Knowledge Network. Uh, it's hard to figure out how that works out as an acronym, but it's better than what it would otherwise be. <laughs> um, so we're delighted to have him here on uh, what is actually a coincidence in a way. The timing is a coincidence. But it's also excellent because it gives us a very clear example of how science actually can play a positive and helpful role in the making of public policy and the interaction between communities, government, and key human interests. So Dr. Bell, over to you. Dr. So, Bell had asked me to just uh, take a second to check in with everyone on the phones. Um, I'm just basically touching base to make sure everyone can hear us well. And um, I think what we'll do for question and answer is when Dr. Bell is finished, if people have questions, we could save them for then. And uh, all you have to do is press star 1 to mute your telephone and press uh, star 1 to unmute. It's like an on-off switch on your phone. So I see that we have Bev White, Doug House, Jen Shea, Jill Allison, Lee, Michelle Wood from Nunatsiavut. And is there anyone else? on the line who we haven't got on the webinar yet. I no? would point out that it's important to mute your phone, which doesn't mute your ability to hear. It just means that there won't be uh, interference on the line from various interactions in your room okay. or between your microphone and our speakers. Okay. So please do that. And Michelle, we, we got your comment. I'm glad that you could hear us well uh, up in Labrador. Thank you. Okay, over right. to you, Trevor. Well, you might wonder why I'm here before you this morning, uh, based on Stephen's yes. intro that he gave me, which I supplied him with. Um, my background is one that's very much, uh, well, you could almost call me a geologist, a physical geographer. I spent many decades walking the landscapes of northern Canada and this province, studying studying change and, and then studying humans on that landscape. I spent many decades working with Priscilla Lenoff and Dave Priscilla Lenoff on archaeology. Um, the reason I'm here today begins a decade ago when 
I decided that I was going to make a commitment in the last couple of decades of my career to do research that really matters. And also, uh, having started to work in northern communities, I realized that there was a lot of priorities in those communities that were not being met by the standard sort of research that was going on. And so, over the last um, five, ten years, and hopefully over the next ten years, that is the focus of what I do. So whether it's the Smart Ice Project, which I hope you'll hear about um, over the next couple of months, a little bit more, um, or whether it um, was dealing with lead in, in soils of St. John's, which is probably a decade ago now, and speaking out, um, I think it's important that scientists, uh, those who can and those who have the ability to take what they do in the lab and to, to mobilize it, to make a difference, especially people who work in northern communities because they, the, we're, we're just slowly building that research capacity and training in those communities. And it's important that we, we identify their priorities and, 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 and sort of design, co-design our research programs with them and help them co-produce that knowledge. And that is really what the Lake Melville, our environment, our health project is all about. The need was identified, and I'm going to say a little bit more formally about that. The need was identified, and I, having worked with the Nazi government for, at that point, five or six years, they asked me if I would bring together a, a group of scientists who could, who could address this issue. And so, the, one of the first major papers was published last year on, on this work, and we could have left it there. It could be very happily sitting on a shelf in a library, but to me, that's not what it's about. To me, it's, an, it's critical that we do excellent international peer-reviewed research, but, that, but we need to mobilize that research. And uh, I think this is a good example of, as Stephen said, where you can move mountains and you can, uh, you know, move with grassroots democracy. You can, it can, it can really make grassroots democracy get traction where it needs to be. And I'm going to talk. I'm going to leave you an opportunity at the end to ask me about this. But if you heard me on the radio this morning, I think uh, it's what I witnessed in those early hours of um, Wednesday morning was, uh, you know, and. Incredible, incredible thing that happened in the sense that not alone was it bringing Aboriginal leaders together unified in Labrador, which is probably from my 30 years experience is the first time, uh, and because the issue was so important, but also I think it was an opportunity um, for science and evidence-based decision making to be raised up on a platform. And I have to say, I sat there with the premier uh, wordsmithing those words. He was in there, uh, get, making sure that was in there. And I think that now there's a document, there's a press release, hopefully there's a lot more, where the people of Labrador and people across Canada can now point to. And I think, I think that's really important. So. That's before I get into the nitty gritty details, and I'm going to probably say more about that at the end if you if you ask me. So I think everybody knows a little bit about uh, the Muscat Falls project, and other people know quite a lot, and others know more than me about it. But um, I, I just wanted to introduce uh, the the context for a little bit about the project. Um, this is a map. I'm a geographer, so I have to start with a map to give you that context. So um, I'm going to just grab a pointer, if you don't mind. I can point from here. And I don't have to get up. All right. And for those on the phone, I'll try and describe what I'm pointing at when, when it's necessary. But on the screen, you probably you probably now see a map of, of Labrador, and it shows uh, the distribution of you know, uh, Inuit and uh, Labrador Inuit settlement area, 
which is the lighter purple, and of course the Labrador Inuit lands, which is the darker sort of purple to red. Uh, what's critical also to see is the sort of yellow and blue area, which is the this area here, just which is the upper Lake Melville region, and it includes both the land and the water there of the the western third of Lake Melville, and that is Inuit special harvesting rights. I mean, I think it's important to know that's not always identified that Inuit have those rights according to their land claim agreement in this area. Uh, we have Happy Valley Goose Bay at the very head of Lake Melville, which of course just uh, everybody knows this, but just to be sure, it's, it's not actually a lake, it's, a, it's an estuary with tidal flow to a very narrow passage here at Rigolette, right at the eastern mouth of it. And, then, and, and because this is such a large body of water, the tides cause a really strong current in that area. People in, in boats need to time when they come through that area because otherwise they'll be pushed backwards, back out, unless they've got very strong, strong engines. So this is important that there's a lot of tidal flow here. Uh, we're also pointing here to the Churchill River at the head of Lake Melville and, and Northwest River here, which is obviously Grand Lake, which is that long uh, finger of, of fresh water, and Northwest River is right at the mouth of it, and Cherishi is also right there at the mouth of that river. You also have Mud Lake, which is actually on the other side of Churchill River, also at the head of uh, Lake Melville. You normally get there by boat across the river or by uh, stone machine. On, on the ice in winter time. Um, so now we come up the river, you can see the, the, the green uh, stars, Muskrat Falls, that's the location of the, uh, the dam that is now, now being constructed. So um, Lake Melville is used by all of those communities I've identified and used by Inu, Inuit, Métis, settlers, everybody who lived there, I think in some degree interact with this body of water. And they either are accessing country food from that, from that estuary, uh, fish and seals, or they're traveling on it. For instance, the amount of travel along the, the north side of it going up the coast in the wintertime is pretty important. So they're relying on the sea ice. So sea ice becomes a winter highway for people. There is no connection otherwise mm. between Rigolette and Norwest River, except in the wintertime, except by snowmobile. <coughs> so th these were all, th everybody, everybody in the region knows how important this is to, to people of the region and to, it's their, in, for, many, for many people, it, it is their food store. They go there for, for food, just like we go to Sobeys, Dominion or whatever. And, uh, and for others, it's also a really big part of their culture, their identity, is that, they, that so we can't just think of it as, as nutrients that go into the body, although it, it actually is. It's very important for that reason, but it's part of their identity and part of their culture. And I think um, any erosion of access to that food or the quality of that food erodes their culture. And I think that is true right across uh, Aboriginal Canada, uh, whether it happens to be saltwater food or it's freshwater food, that doesn't matter. And, and the sooner we all uh, um, recognize and support that and build that into our thinking, I think that's important, especially decision makers. Next slide, please. Um, so I, I need to just get now into a little bit around NALCOR and go back three or four, four years, five years now to the Joint Environmental Review Panel. So that's a process by which all large projects need to go through to get approval and sanctioning by the federal government or provincial government. And the process is usually there's an environmental assessment report produced and then there's a panel struck that reviews the information that's provided primarily by the proponent, but also maybe supporting information from organizations from government. So for instance, in the national government actively participated in that project. People in Rigolette and all the other communities came down and sat through all of those weeks of sessions 
and where they couldn't always bring their elders, they taped them and produced video uh, of them talking about what happened. When you think of Lake Melville you can't, and, and hydro projects, you can't ignore the small, the, the upper Churchill project, which for us is this pain in the neck, economic reality that we're, we apparently are losing a lot of money for it. But people in Lake Melville have changed their lives. And I think you need to watch the videos of people talking about that at that joint review panel to realize the impact it had on people. To realize, just in the physical environment, river, you know, uh, Grand Lake, sort of the, the, the flow of water into Grand Lake was significantly reduced because rivers were, were, were diverted. As a result, salt water intrudes into some of these uh, areas, or in fact, the flow out of these systems is not as strong. The people recognize the difference in almost immediately in the, in the freshwater biota in the lake. You suddenly, because it, you, we were cutting off and re diverting, you suddenly saw this movement of seal species becoming very different. And a lot of other people would have, uh, elders had comments about both land animals, water animals, the quality of the environment, the change even in the weather that that caused, because the small reservoir is a huge, a huge body of water now up in central Labrador that was affecting how air masses were moving down. Scientifically, what do we know about the effects of the Upper Churchill? Almost nothing. Why? Because nobody said that we should be doing baseline studies. Nobody said that we should be doing uh, follow-up studies to see if there is any impact. It was just done. Nobody was told. You know, I guess people knew about it, but nobody was consulted about it. And you know, there's a there's probably a legacy of that project that that resided in the way Nalco behaved and how, you know, I think if you if you heard me in the, on the radio this morning, I mean, I think probably the Muskrat Falls project will become a textbook a textbook case study for students on how not to proceed with social acceptance for a large project. A large project that is now one of the biggest investments this province has ever made. And yet there was almost, well, there was no real effort to, to get community acceptance. And the, I, the idea of proceeding without that is no longer viable, as, as has demonstrated over the last couple of weeks. And really, the sooner that the engineers and the economists of these projects realize that, I think it's really, I think the sooner they'll learn not to. That's, that, in fact, is the greatest risk, maybe, uh, not having that social acceptance. So, through that environmental review panel, NALCOR predicted that, and I need to identify, so I need to go back one to the, to the map, sure. just to identify this for you. So there's, so there's Lake Melvin, there's a small basin in here called Goose Bay, and I, I want to just differentiate that from the community. So we, I will talk about Goose Bay as this little inner you know, uh, basin, which is very shallow here. They have to, they have to um, uh, dredge it quite frequently to allow the larger, the, the ferry and other larger ships to get into Happy Valley Goose Bay here. So Nalco predicted that Goose Bay dilutes any effects originating from upstream to no measurable effects. And I'm quoting them from their panel. Based on this assumption, the boundary for assessing downstream aquatic impacts of, of Churchill Falls was drawn at the mouth of the Churchill River. And therefore, Lake Melville itself was excluded from the environmental assessment area. That was a, a that, that was a huge decision to allow that to happen because therefore this nothing will what would ha would happen downstream at the mouth of the river would be uh, the subject of any detailed analysis so and that was you know based on on some nalcor modeling which I'm going to explain to you before and, and this is important I tell you this I know it's getting into the weeds but you need to understand the how this how we got to where we we are today and that was one of the key 
decision makers. So there was no responsibility then on Nalcor. And even when we met with them uh, at least a couple of times over the last couple of years, where we were had raised millions of dollars and were spending a million dollars a summer to do field work in Lake Melville, where we extended a hand, if you like, to Nalcor and said, did you want to come in with us and, and, and be part of this study? Their answer was always absolutely flat. There are no measurable effects of the Muskrat Falls project downstream of the Malibu River. We do not, therefore, need to do that. We only take instructions from the proponent, the regulators of this project, which is the provincial and federal government. So, several occasions they missed the opportunity to be part of something which would have built social acceptability and confidence, and but they flatly denied that opportunity. Okay, next slide. Um, I, w I just want to, I'm going to go faster with these slides than, than this, but I, the, I do, and I have to read some of these because I'm taking quotes, but it's important once again that you know this. So the joint review panel listened to everybody and then came out with numerous recommendations. I'm just going to identify some of the things that, 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 that the panel concluded. It's a, in quoting, Nalcor's assertion that there would be no measurable effects on levels of mercury in Goose Bay and Lake Melville, that's the two basins, has not been substantiated. Nalcor did not carry out a full assessment of the fate of mercury in the downstream environment. Lack of information from previous projects was likely compounded by Nalcor's decision to place the study boundary at the mouth of the river. The panel said this, you know, we're talking about five years ago. But it says the panel cannot confidently conclude what the ecological effects would be downstream of Muskrat Falls. If consumption advisories are required, this would constitute a significant adverse effect. So in other words, if there were ecological effects and the, and the requirement for consumption advisory, they stated it would be a significant adverse effect. It also stated that if the downstream effect assessment indicates that consumption advisories would be required, Nalcor should enter into negotiations prior to impoundment. But we won't get into necessarily into that. But you can see that they did not really have much trust in what Nalcor had said. And so all those recommendations were subsequently uh, ignored by the provincial government. They did not act on those, they did not force uh, Nalcor to actually do a better job with the downstream um, uh, impacts assessment and therefore we ended up with the position we were in the other day. Okay, next slide. So as a result of uh, the inability for the Nunatsiva government to actually get any traction from the provincial federal government to actually make Nalcor do the study. Uh, the Nunatsiva government approached me to put together a team to do the study themselves. Probably unheard of in, in other jurisdictions that the people who were being impacted did the research to try to demonstrate the risk. And when was it in? And I, I can't tell you that exactly, okay. um, not this morning anyway. Um, yeah, you'd have to get me in a better morning to, okay. to remember okay. the actual year, but we're going back. We've been at this probably six, five or six years. Okay. So uh, obviously after the panel decision mm -hmm. and recommendation and there was discussions, probably not long after that. Um, so we, we uh, so I was asked to put that together, and we put together a group of people. We brought together the person who they had already been dealing with, Elsie Sunderland from Harvard University, who formerly worked for the Environmental Protection Agency in the U.S. and is now a, a research uh, chair at, at Harvard University, regarded as one of the world leading experts in metal mercury uh, and across the world. 
Um, and we look, we we um, in, drew into this team people from Memorial, from physics and physical oceanography, from geography, people from uh, Manitoba, um, University of Connecticut. So there's a, there was a range of people involved in the project. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about those. But we then, next slide, we went, this actually shows you a range of, but we went out and then secured funding to support this program. So these are, uh, uh, Arctic Net, for instance, is a competitive process. So is um, NSF in the States. So we went out, put in proposals, and got funding to fund this project. And it, with cash and in-kind support, there were some summers where we were operating at about a million dollars because we needed to get ships, boats, uh, for all sorts of sampling uh, in, the, in Lake Melville, in the rivers, on the land. And uh, so it was, it was expensive to do that. But it was important that it was part of what the national government recognized was the need. They, they predicted that down the road that we would need to have the best research, independently funded research, and peer-reviewed publications in order to in order to uh, balance the power against the provincial government and the regulators. And actually, that is incredibly true, because that is ultimately, I think, what helped to convince, or maybe convince is too soft a word, but convince the provincial government that they should be doing something about it. Uh, clearly, the protests and the grassroots democracy in action was, was even probably more important, but it was built on the ground, and it was built on the confidence that this research would have that independence. And of course, when I'm in communities, I think it's important not here probably, but in the communities to explain that there's many different types of research. And, and what NALCO, the research that they were doing, was research that through consultants. So they asked, they told the consultants what questions that they needed to be answered. They were paying them to answer those questions. And that's very different from when researchers are allowed the freedom to say, I actually need to know this entire system. I'm going to decide what the research questions are. I'm going to apply to competitive research grants. I'm going to get that money, and then I'm going to publish the results. And uh, when I'm in communities, it's important to contrast that, because sometimes we just talk about research in universities, and don't, we don't always distinguish the many different types of research that you can be doing. Next slide. So we, we um, did an incredible amount of, uh, of work, and we, the focus of the Lake Melville Science Report, and you can access that on the Make Muskrat Right uh, website, we had all sorts of different people looking at physical lake processes, climate, sea ice, sediments and organic carbon, and metal, mercury, metal mercury. And it's this last one, clearly, that we want to focus on today. But I just want to let you know that all of this work is built upon a, a range of other studies that that are all integrated in, into this. Um, next slide. So this is one of the vessels that we hired uh, to do some of our sampling. But it reminds me to tell you that we are one of the first uh, programs to actually do to, to take the first measurements in Lake Melville on a large range of processes. It's not the first research that was done in Lake Melville, but we're the first attempt to look at it as a system, an operating system. Um, and it, therefore, it's really important to stress and contrast with the NALCO research, which did not take measurements in the downstream environment. So they relied solely on modeling. And they took, they took data from other reservoirs across the country and made assumptions about Lake Melville. So the, some of those assumptions were that anything, as I said earlier, anything that comes down the Churchill River will be diluted within the inner basin. Even. And so that dilution factor was an important way in which they were able to convince people that the environmental assessment should not go beyond the mouth of the river. So we took extent next slide, we took extensive measurements 
this is just a map to show you lots of things that we did in this area. Um, but we really wanted to understand the system because you can't really predict what's going to happen unless you understand it. So we employed local people, we as field assistants, as community researchers, a very large program that extends from everything from um, uh, food recall questionnaires to uh, uh, mercury, uh, collecting of hair samples for mercury analysis to sampling seals and, and, and fish and all aspects of the food web, uh, working from ships to collect water, to collect sediment, to collect even those you know small cookie pods that you saw, not not fox like you said they were fox. <laughs> yeah. um, we didn't sample foxes. Um, so there was a lot of effort went into this, and and I think people in the region need to be feel proud that this was they were part of this project, and they participated in this project, and they are. They have, a, they have that investment in it. So just let me tell you about two things that we've learned in this part, uh, that we learned, the highlights from this larger program. So maybe the next slide. So we went out there with ships, deployed buoys in the water that lasted, that extended over the entire year. We wanted to know how is the water moving down, moving around in this lit large basin? What did the fresh water do? And so, because that, of course, determines what happens with water from the Churchill River and what happens anything, the metal mercury that might come down that river or the carbon that comes down that river. So, the first thing that we realized from doing this study is that Lake Melville, as Nalcor had assumed, is not a well mixed estuary. In fact, it is highly stratified. So, I just want you to look at the colors here um, in this diagram. This looks at the degree of fresh water. And so the red at the bottom, I'm sorry, I guess people on the phone can, are watching the, the I'll, I'll describe the colors to help you see what I'm pointing at. So the reddish uh, thick area at the bottom of Lake Melville, which is a pretty deep basin, it's, it's hundreds of meters deep uh, in the middle. This is all salt water uh, that comes in from Rigolette over here to tidal currents twice a day, obviously. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mix very well. You can see the purple at the very top leading down into the blues. This is the fresh water coming in from the left, from the west, from the Churchill River and other rivers. And it stays pretty much coherently right across the, the entire estuary. And it doesn't mix. So that's what we mean by well stratified. So what flows into Lake Malvo travels very quickly and very efficiently. I think we calculated that, you know, if you can imagine this, if you dropped a popsicle stick in at the mouth of the Churchill River, within a couple of days it would be going out through Rigolet. It's an incredibly fast surface current. Big rivers flowing into it and it's just moving, moving through, but not mixing. So one of the assumptions of Nalcor that on which they base their conclusion that we shouldn't be looking at downstream impacts is false. So sorry, can I just ask a quick question? Yeah. In this picture here, this is a cross section of Lake Melville going from the west to the east? Yeah, sorry, I made okay. that assumption. Yeah. So is Goose Bay, the smaller basin, included in that picture? Uh, no. It's not. Okay. So Goose Bay is so shallow that it wouldn't really appear on this image. So it's So it's, it's hardly it's brackish at all, Goose Bay. Yeah. It's, it would be fresh water, and um, but but not absolutely fresh. But if you yeah. go for people who go swimming in Northwest River, you will know if you take them out for the water, it isn't like it isn't like seawater. It's it's fairly it's fairly fresh. It's hard to swim in. It's not quite so buoyant um, for those of us who aren't very good swimmers. Um, so yes, sorry, I made that assumption. So that, this diagram here on the bottom is um, a profile to the, to the depths of Lake Melville. On the right-hand side, it's cut off a bit, but if you kept going to the right, you would find Rigolette, maybe around the end of the word freshwater. And Goose Bay is on our left uh, uh, of that diagram. And then you have water depth. I'm not sure how I lost my, my, um, my water depth numbers, but anyway, it's not showing up. But 
the deepest part of Lake Melville is a couple of hundred meters deep. And that's all you, that's really what's important there. Um, and then the photograph just shows a couple of us on board one of the larger vessels when we were deploying. This is the bottom of a, a, a oceanographic buoy, which we, we put a couple of those into the, into the basin uh, to watch how the water was moving over the 12 months of the year. Next slide. So uh, the other highlight I want to talk about was the sediments and organic carbon. Um, so this is us, important just to identify Joey Angertok and his brother here using a box core of the Inuit owned vessel, What's Happening, which we use for research. And you drop that down to the bottom and it collects sediments off the bottom at any depth. So this, once again, using local people and their expertise to help in this sampling. So, uh, of course, one of the things that Nalco had said that there's no that a lot of the uh, material doesn't actually get out beyond that shallow goose bay and into the main system. We, in fact, by doing this analysis, were able to determine that in some cases, two-thirds of the material coming out of the river was getting past goose basin and traveling right out into Lake Melville. So, so in fact, there isn't the goose bay basin, which is very shallow and has a shallow sill on it, or not at the narrows, is not necessarily a barrier to the movement of material and organic carbon right out into the main system. And so just the next slide will show that, just sort of, so it, I'm po just pointing out here the inner basin goose, uh, goose Bay here, which is right outside of Mud Lake. It was determined that, in fact, material was moving right out into Lake Melville very, very efficiently. Another one of the assumptions that we were able to, with actual measurement, say was incorrect. So let's, uh, next slide, and I'm going to try and move a little bit faster here just to sort of help get through this. I think many people here in the room and on the phone probably know lots about mercury, metal mercury, so I don't have to say too much about this. I just want to make the distinction between inorganic mercury and metal mercury, both uh, most importantly from a health perspective that, in fact, inorganic mercury, or quicksilver, as it's sometimes called, is, 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 does, it doesn't necessarily represent a major health impact. It has very little absorption into the body. It sort of flows right through you if you were to, to um, consume it. And probably as kids, we all did playing around with it on tabletops and then licking our, <laughs> licking our fingers. <laughs> on the right-hand side is, is metal mercury, and, of course, it is greater than 90% absorbed into the body when, when consumed, say, through country food. And, you know, it's, it, it has long-term neurocognitive effects on children and in adults, probably endocrine and cardiovascular impacts as well. Uh, but as I say, there's probably a lot more people that know more about those health impacts. But I, I think people recognize that it does have an impact. And it's worth saying at this point that maybe it's at, at very it's it's hard to measure at low levels, and we are getting better and better and better at being able to detect it at extremely low levels. We're talking about uh, not nanograms but picograms. Uh, it's incredibly sensitive, and the more we the more we're able to measure smaller amounts of it, we're able to do the epidemiological studies that show. Essentially, there are no safe thresholds for methyl mercury. We, all, we seem to be always able to correlate even those very low levels with some sort of health impact. And in that sense, it's very much like lead. Where lead, we now realize there is no safe uh, guidelines around lead, and we really need to move away from these uh, antiquated safe thresholds that really don't mean anything anymore. So does it accumulate then in your body? It will ultimately pass through. Okay. Yeah, there's a resi residency time. Okay. Um, so for the two key things that I think you need to understand from the perspective and, and for Inuit health especially is the fact that metal mercury bioaccumulates and biomagnifies in the food web such that 
although levels can be down, pointing down to the bottom left of this diagram, which shows the progression from very water up to the lowest parts of the food web on the bottom left up to the top right, where Inuit are at the top, and you look, you see seals up there. And the, the sort of scale is really changing the amount of concentrations of methylmercury. And what we mean here is that even though uh, the water drops and methylmercury in water, you can actually, as I, we say in the communities, you can drink a swimming pool of that water every day and not have any health impact. But the fact that it biomagnifies up to the food chain means that up here, 10 to 100 million times increase in the concentration in the food web. That is what's key here. So the metal mercury in the water itself is, is not a hazard, it's its bioaccumulation in the food web as you move up to the food web. This, um, okay, I'll keep going. So the next slide, the other important point here is to understand how does metal mercury get generated when you, when you create a reservoir. So in this little cartoon here, I just want you to focus on the left-hand side first, which shows a landscape like you would see in the, in the, around the margins of the Churchill River today, where you have a forest, lower vegetation, and the brown is representing the soil. And you can see that, obviously, organic carbon is everywhere in that system. It's in the, it's in the trees but it's also in the soil, accumulated as leaves and twigs fall on the ground and break down into finer and finer and finer material. And the really fine organic carbon, you talk about it being labile, in other words, it's very accessible, very to chemical reactions, as opposed to a tree, which is not accessible, it has to decompose, which will obviously take decades for that to happen. So this is the situation on land when we actually, sorry. Oops, yeah. I don't know what's going on with the slides. Okay. Um, can I ask people on the um, online not to advance the slides? Okay, I don't know what's going on, but I think people, I may have hit something here. I'm just going to sit there. Okay. I'm just going to keep right. talking. You sorry. can work that out. No, it's okay. On the, on the right-hand side here is meant to uh, symbolize maybe uh, the the cur well, I have to watch out saying current now because after the last couple of days it should no longer be the current situation. But what the original Nalcor plan was was to take out and cut down some of the trees and leave everything else in place, and then raise the water level to inundate the reservoir to impound the water up behind the dam. What that facilitates is, so, so the other thing I wanted to show you here is inorganic mercury, the pink, is everywhere in our environment. It's in the soil that naturally occurs. It has been elevated because of industrial uh, activity around the world, and so we, we would have higher levels of mercury in the soil. But that mercury is not necessarily a health impact because it's mostly that inorganic mercury which as a child you might have been licking and doing all the other things with it. So it's, it's not a concern. But what happens here is that you, when you create the right conditions to uh, water logging the soils and filling, filling the, inundating them with water, you're creating the conditions that bacteria, methylating bacteria, can change the inorganic mercury to metal mercury. And that reaction, that conversion by bacteria, is fueled by the organic carbon. So you've got to keep your eye on the, not just the presence of inorganic mercury, but also inorganic carbon, which is fueling the equation. So if you tuck all of the sources of, inner, of organic carbon out of that right-hand picture there, there would be no metal mercury production. It would still just sit in inorganic mercury. May I ask a quick question? Yeah. Okay. So. You were saying that there's mercury, sort of because of industrial processes and natural occurrence, you find mercury everywhere. Yes. And we've been building dams for a while now. Yeah. So presumably, this phenomenon has, was known before Muskrat Falls. Oh, yes. Okay. I just wanted to. So, and, and the medical uh, research has been done on the impacts on Cree in Quebec, uh, who many decades afterwards are still suffering. Uh, 
children with reduced IQ um, and cardiovascular sort of health impacts on adults who are eating the fish out of that reservoir. So okay. that's a well-known, documented, unfortunately, uh, product of doing this. Okay. But what has not really been examined here was an Inuit population living downstream from a dam. The idea that the effects of this, this methylmercury stays in the reservoir, uh, or that it goes downstream and nobody really lives there, so it doesn't really matter. Mm. Or maybe it's just Aboriginal people live there and it doesn't really matter. Maybe there's that attitude as well. So that's what, so you're right, that's well known and has had impacts. And so the Hydro Quebec are, are, are dealing with that issue. So, next slide. So I'm going to uh, focus on these next four points, um, and this is to help you understand. So the first thing is we need to work out what's the pulse of methyl mercury in the flooded reservoir, how much will be created and therefore transported. So quickly moving to the next slide. Can you just tell me how I'm doing for time? You're fine. It's 11:20, and we have until the okay. 12, so okay. we're doing well. Um, so. How, how we uh, communicated this to Inuit and, and the, the residents of Nunatsi River and people living around Lake Malvo was really to try and help them so we don't necessarily get into all of the, the technical details, was to create scenarios. And so the scenarios we built, and I need to tell you about this now because we'll, address, we'll use them throughout the rest of the slides. So, in fact, I'm actually going to start at the bottom here. And the bottom two, the moderate and high metal mercury scenarios, assumes that NALCOR's original plan of only taking out some trees but leaving everything else, which would ultimately lead in metal mercury production. Those are those two scenarios. The difference between the moderate and the high is really, and you can tell that by the size of the white arrow we have, is what happens when the metal mercury leaves the reservoir and travels down the river. Because traveling down the river, you actually have a decomposition, a breakdown of the metal mercury. And we know so little about that. We created two scenarios. One where there was a there was a fairly moderate sort of decrease in that metal mercury, therefore not a lot was getting into Lake Melville, versus where there was very low composition and quite a bit was getting into Lake Melville. So that's the difference, difference between the moderate and the high. Okay. The top scenario, the low metal mercury scenario, uh, assumed that you were, that NACO would be made to take out all the vegetation and the soils that needed to be taken out. In other words, what was termed full clearing. And that's a term that's, that's been used quite commonly, and we can still use that if we refer to removal of all of the soil that science identifies needs to be removed from the reservoir. So I'm going to come back to these. Do you have any questions on those scenarios just because we keep coming back to them? There is a question on the line from uh, Dr. Smith asking, are you sure that the bacteria are absent from the water regardless of organic uh, carbon from trees? I'm not clear on the question. So uh, maybe it means, uh, are we sure that they're present in the water to cause the methylating chemical process, perhaps? Frank, are you able to unmute your phone so you can ask Trevor directly? Hello? We can't hear you right now. Just press star 1 on your phone. And we can come back to it at the end. Yeah, perhaps sure. we'll come back to it at the end, Frank. Okay. Okay. Sorry. So, um, next slide. Sure. So we actually uh, did experiments. We went in and took samples of the soil right beside the Churchill River, that was going to right right next to the river and also farther inland, but still within the area that will sorry inland away from the river, that would be inundated by the higher water levels, and we. Did, we did some experiments on that. So we were taking basically a sample of this soil here. And um, we, that, those analyses showed that within 72 hours, we were getting 
metal mercury produced. Uh, so basically, the photograph on the left shows you our experiment where we have in these little core tubes, we have soil taken from the area and we're actually being able to over time sample the metal mercury that's being produced in the overlying water. That water came from the Churchill River and we're, we watched it uh, because they limited the experiment, we only watched it for 120 hours. But we know that within 72 hours, there was a 14 fold increase in metal mercury. And when we had to stop it at 120 hours, the, the, the amount of metal mercury was exponentially increasing. And we know from other studies that the, that the peak metal mercury production usually takes one to two years. So we have actually have had to monitor it for quite a while to actually get that peak. But when we stopped monitoring, it was still continuing to rise exponentially. And we had a 14, 14 uh, time is increased at seven, uh, around 72 hours. Mm. So, we, so we know that that happened, but that was the limit of the measurements that we could take from the basin. What we did instead was we know, um, next slide please. So what we know is that from other, other studies on reservoirs, but other, and other studies, in, I don't know if you know the experimental lakes area in Northern Ontario, where they actually did a lot of these full system experiments where they you know, either monitor metal mercury in those basins over a long period of time and, and maybe even created experimental sort of little reservoir areas. And we know that there's actually a very strong connection between the available organic carbon, which is shown in the right hand graph here along the bottom, and on the y axis of this little graph, the peak. Uh, metal mercury production and so we only have four points on here we have more subsequent from that research we've identified other basins that are comparable with this from from the southern hemisphere but so um, can you go to the next slide so what we are showing here is uh, the triangle that I've added to this graph and the green arrow shows basically if you partial clearance what is the amount of organic carbon that would be in that basin and therefore what would we what does the, the data from other areas show would be the the peak net metal mercury production and you can see it up there at about 35,000 milligrams per hectare per year Next. 3,500 would I say 3,500? Yeah. 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 Next slide. The difference, and this is where you have full clearing. So now I'm looking, asking you to look at the light green square that's on the bottom. If you were to clear the reservoir, <coughs> then the available organic carbon drops from 30 to 10 here hmm. tons, and therefore you would expect that the production would be much, much lower. lower. And so we use these sorts of scenarios to help drive the rest of the program. And I, I want to stop there and say to you that what the decision, no, I'm not, I'm continuing wrong, but I want to stop for a second, pause, just to say that the decision on Tuesday and what we are mobilizing on Monday on the ground in this area with having hopefully secured the permission of NALCOR through the government yesterday is not to use these sorts of assumptions from other reservoirs, but we will be on the ground to measure the, the amount of metal mercury production based on the organic content of the soil. So we're going to be setting up, taking samples of these experiments, and then actually, once it's inundated, trying to measure the metal mercury that's been produced, even in situ, in the impounded area as well as true experiments. So we will be able to much better refine mm -hmm. what that metal mercury production is, what drives our entire system. So next slide. So then uh, what I want to what I want to do now is just say, well what happens I want to, this photo of the river reminds me to say that the next slide I'm going to show you, I want to emphasize shows you what we projected to be the metal mercury that's been carried down the river. Next slide, please. 
So once again, I'm using those scenarios to remind you from the left. And then, and so we measured metal mercury in the river. We know right now some of the baseline measurements. There's quite a lot of variability. And so we need to do a lot more sampling in that river. And for doing monitoring of the potential impact and change over time, it means from just simple statistical power analysis, we have to ensure that the provincial government who's in charge of that water sampling collects enough samples to be able to detect the changes that we would expect from this project. And that's something that we're going to have to be pushing very hard uh, and, and keep a, a fairly strict eye on that that sort of monitoring has the ability to detect change. And what it means also that the measurements, the detection limits of the lab are sufficient enough. It is no good if the lab keeps telling us there are no detect, it's below detectable limits. That's a cop out. And we have told the provincial government that, that the, the, the lab in Harvard is not accredited to do this type of monitoring work, but it is at the leading edge of being able to measure these very low levels. Remember, there is going to be low levels. It's the bioaccumulation that makes them big levels when it gets up to the human system. But if you can't measure those lower levels, then all the government is going to say is, it's, it's, no, it's, it's below detection limits, which does not mean it's safe. It means it's, they haven't in, engaged the lab or insisted that the lab have the reproducibility and the detect, detection limits. Mm. So we need to be really vigilant, and people in Labrador are going to be really vigilant. But it's, I think it's, once again, the pressure is on us as scientists to identify that potential weakness at the onset and to insist that it the monitoring is done to the highest standards. And so now we can quote Premier Ball to say that it has to be evidence-based monitoring, it has to be science-based monitoring. Prior to this, I'm sure the provincial government would have just pushed this down the throats of Labrador Inuit to say, well, this is the way we always do it. This is the way we're going to do it now. We can now, based on the agreement on Tuesday, say, no, the best science possible is going to inform this, and you need to do a better job at this. And you can tell that that's pretty fresh in my mind because I spent yes. much of yesterday, <laughs> much of yesterday, uh, insisting on that. So that's written into the agreement that oh, that level of, of pushback from the scientific. Well, built into the agreement, as you saw mm -hmm. from the press release, is the insistence that all decisions at Muskrat Falls related to metal mercury will be science-based and evidence-based. So it's not based on, well, we've always done that, so we'll just keep doing it. It's based on what do you need to measure to be able to detect and protect the new health and detect these metal mercury changes. So that's why I think it's a game changer in, in, in this respect, because we can force these changes, whereas before you had to just you know, you just got horse telling people about it, but that didn't <laughs> seem to make them change. And it sets a precedent. It sets a precedent mm -hmm. for everything regarding this project, and it changes the standards across mm -hmm. Canada. And is it regime change sort of bulletproof? Like, will will it last beyond this government, or will it? Well, agreement. Having spent the last ten days communicating with Billy Gautier, one of the hunger strikers, I can tell you that. Uh, they better be, I'm <laughs> going to use that word carefully, I just, the bulletproof part, but yeah. they better be bulletproof because these guys aren't going to, they'll be back. They, they, they're they not going to let go of this one. Right? And I think the people in Labrador aren't going to let go of this one. So in that sense, they have a lot of eyes watching them. And right. as scientists now, I don't think we need to speak very loudly to get to have that sort of support behind us. That's the difference it makes. So anyway, so here you can see uh, the current, the baseline measurements is black at the top. You can see it's fairly low. And we, that's why I got into that talk about detection limits. We need to be able to detect what the baseline is now. And therefore, so it's not good enough for the provincial government to say, well, we can detect this level, 0 0.3, the maximum projected level. 
right? It does sound, that sounds good enough because then if it's somewhere in point two five, well, it's not detectable, therefore it must be safe. We need them to be measuring and getting labs to determine this level, mm. at least. And so that's a key distinction that we need to be putting pressure on, not for this, but for all other projects. And is that in the agreement, or is that sort of covered by science and evidence-based? It's, it's, there is no agreement except the what you saw in that press release, right? And so what we were doing yesterday was starting the the negotiations about the monitoring program, for instance, and we'll next week it will be about the uh, about external assessment of the need for the flood, and after that, so it, it's. But I mean, we can take the press release and say, that's the commitment you make. Do you want me to go on the radio? Do you want me to tell people in Labrador that, that you're not? Because that's what the commitment, and I think even Minister Trimper on the radio yesterday made that incredibly clear, that, that that's the new regime, that's that's what needs, it's evidence-based. If, if the scientific evidence says you need to clear every spoonful of soil out of that reservoir area, it's going to be removed. What's feasibly possible and what keeps people who are removing it safe, we're not going to them in danger. Uh, so those are the numbers that we're sort of looking at, potentially a 15 times increase at the maximum uh, in the highest scenario to at the low scenario, only three times higher methyl mercury in the river coming out of the reservoir and going downstream. Next slide. So the second uh, point I want to focus on is the accumulation of methyl mercury in the downstream environment. So next slide. So here, this is what happens when the mercury comes out of the Churchill River and flows as now as we know. It doesn't just somehow get it magically diluted in blue space and it'll never be seen again. We know it travels right out into Lake Melville. It's largely confined to that shallow, it's actually only about 10 meters thick, that freshwater layer at the top. And that, that is a real important distinction to make uh, from the work that we've done. Next slide. So this is a slide, once again, you can see the little inset there is what I took from the previous diagram uh, that shows you the stratification with the fresh water at the top. So here I want to show you this other cartoon, which is off Lake Melville, and here we have Goose Bay sort of up on the, on the right where the Churchill River enters, and somewhere on the, sorry, did I say right? On the yeah. left, yeah. and somewhere on the right out here is Rigolet. So this is the, the main basin shown just in broad terms. So that fresh, the surface fresh water is a really interesting area, and I've got to depart a little bit from the gist of what I'm saying here, just to explain that to you. So here coming down the river is obviously both methyl mercury produced in the reservoir, but also mercury that's released in the river that occurs naturally, and there's also the organic carbon coming down the river, dissolved organic carbon and otherwise, and flowing into this fresh water layer along here. What we found for the first time ever in any estuary that's ever been worked on is in fact that not alone is this freshwater layer very efficient at transporting the metal mercury from the reservoir out in across into Lake Melville. We found that in fact metal mercury itself is being produced in that surface layer because of the high levels of stratification. Mm -hmm. So in, so a little blow up I have down on the bottom right here shows you, it blows up the area between the light blue and the darker sort of blue. So the, the fresh water at the top and then the more saline water beneath it. And we've identified this, what it's a called, the scientists call the snow layer. But it's, it's an area of organic matter, matter here that because of the density difference, it doesn't sink to the bottom of Lake Melville, it sinks to the bottom of the fresh water layer and accumulates there. And so what happens is you have this fuel sitting there, you have mercury in the system, you have the bacteria, and you're actually actively producing metal mercury in this layer. And so I'm, I'll stop there and just say that was the first time ever that had been identified. It's not, it's not as significant as what's happening in the reservoir. But nevertheless, it now had a 
taken the time to look, they might have discovered that, oh, look at this. This is a, this is a first for science, but it has a really interesting implication. Mm. Next slide. So I, I'm just jumping here to telling you about what are the changes in concentration now in methylmercury? Because we took lots of measurements of this basin. We didn't, we tried not to make assumptions, we tried to take measurements. We tried to understand the complete system. So, reminding you what Nalco Energy said in 2009, which is almost seven years ago, Lake Melville is not included in the assessment areas. There will be no change in flow or salinity, water temperature, ice, or other physical disturbance beyond the mouth of the Churchill River from this project. What we are projecting is, in fact, there's going to be up to almost four times, potentially, under the high scenario of increases in methyl mercury in Lake Melville. Today, this, these are the actual measurements that we've made in here. Once again, these are the first measurements ever taken of methyl mercury in, this, in the Lake Melville system. And it's a very large system. It's 250 kilometers long. It takes an hour to fly from almost from Rigolette to Goose Bay along the length of it. So it, it, it's a long system. So here the, on the low projection, there would be about 13% increase. So if you were to clear all the organics from the, the, the pound area, if you don't, if you go as Nalcor suggested, but there was a lot of degradation of, of metal mercury in the river, then we projected in Lake Melville, there would be about an 80% increase. And then this is the high projection here at 380% increase. I'm going to scare you with the next slide, and I'm just showing you this to tell you that we, Elsie Sunderland and her team, which included postdocs, PhDs, a whole range of people, learned and found out about the entire system in Lake Melville. So we didn't just look mm -hmm. up in this area. They understand this is a mechanistic model showing what happens to metal mercury in the system. So we know exactly what's coming in from the Labrador Sea, right. what's going out. We know what's exchanged with the sediments at the bottom. We know what's happening up in this upper layer. I'm not going to go into these details and probably don't have the expertise to do that. Elsie could do that. But I just want to show you that we're, you know, we're not looking at this through a keyhole. We are trying to understand the system. And so that allows us to see the bigger picture. Next slide. So jumping up to the third part, which is, OK, what happens when we have this metal mercury in the system? We, we said that it uh, biomagnifies in the system. Next slide. So what's key here is that the metal mercury, both what's coming down out of the reservoir through the Churchill River and what's been formed in situ, is up here in this upper layer. The photic zone, it's about 10 meters thick. It's where basically there's a concentration of, of the food web up there. And it's right where that, so the metal mercury is right there where the food web, the lowest levels of that food web, the phytoplankton, and up to those uh, angry, dangerous looking <laughs> things, and then up into fish and larger fish. And so on the little left inset there, you can see my. So like bioaccumulation factor here, we, you know, it's up to 10 million to 100 million as you go from what's in the water here to the phytoplankton, up to the copepods, up to the smaller fish, and up into the larger fish, up into the seals. Hmm. Next slide. So we, through a lot of community researchers, we would have gone to people in Lake Melville and we want to find out what do they eat. So what part of this food web is important for, for health? And so we, uh, through um, interviews, food recall questionnaires and interviews with people, over a thousand Inuit were interviewed in the Lake Melville region three times because we wanted to catch the different seasons of the year where different country food is available. So this is an extensive survey. As at one of our meetings that the provincial government, government organized in August, 
uh, it was stated in there that we were asked why did we do such an extensive survey, but that's normally not what is done for a health risk assessment. And I don't think anybody answered that. I think people's jaws dropped really at that point uh, because the philosophy is really about how little can we do and get away with it. Our philosophy was how much do we need to do to be able to protect and use health. And you need very large sample sizes to be able to capture the the extreme the extreme values. I mean that's a standard sort of science statement. But anyway, you do you need a large sample size to get the extremes. And the, the people, the even most at risk here are the ones who are in those extreme levels. That's ultimately where you're targeting. So we needed to know who who they were in a sense, really what they ate. That's what we need to know. So you can see this is just a small sample of all of the different species that we, we looked at. And you can see that we differentiate between store-bought, which the metal mercury measurements were done either from the literature or we actually sampled these. We did the analysis. So clearly there's lots available on commercially bought tuna, what the metal mercury contents are. But then the local foods like seal kidney, lake trout, uh, turn eggs, lanticada, as I say, this list continues right across. There's, there's probably 30, 40 different species or parts of species that you eat that we needed to include in this. Mm -hmm. And it shows you the current, the, this current baseline uh, sort of uh, condition. So what that allowed us to do was calculate bioaccumulation factors for every species in that would be eaten in Lake Melville or otherwise. So we didn't take that from the literature. We actually knew how much water was in Lake Melville. We knew how much water, uh, sorry, we knew how much metal mercury was in the water of Lake Melville, in the water of Churchill River, in the water outside of Lake Melville in the ocean. And then we, we have measurements of the metal mercury in the species. As you'll see later, when we calculate what the potential future impact is, we don't just apply a factor. To other analyses, tracers, we know how each of, how long each of those species spend part of the year in each of those environments because the metal mercury concentration will be different in the river, in the lake, in the estuary, and then out in the ocean. Right. And and so we we're not simply applying factors, we're able to actually very carefully know how this disturbance in the metal mercury levels will we can follow it right through the food system. And ultimately, because we took so much hair measurements in people and we know what they're eating, we can actually carry it right into people. So next slide. So here we project using the information I just told you, we can project how the metal mercury concentrations are going to change in the individual species according to the three scenarios and by the life cycle of those species. How long they're spending in different areas of water with different projected metal mercury concentrations. As the person said at that meeting, why did you go why did you do all that work? You know, because you need to know. This is to really do a risk assessment. You need to do this. So we are able to, for landlocked salmon, for loon, for pigeon eggs, for char liver. I'm just working my way for those on the phone. I'm working, or I'm working my way across that list. I'm just showing you. For each of those, we know we can project based on the amount of metamorphic that's been potentially projected under those different scenarios what would the increases be for each of these foods? Just next slide. That's okay. This. So then, no, no, Oops, sorry. sorry. Right, yeah. So then that little piece at the bottom reminds us that ultimately to understand the exposure, we need to then know how much are people eating of these different foods that will have these projected increases on these different scenarios. Next slide. So maybe I'll go back and just explain. For some of these, I mean, I think it's really important to 
and go back one more. Sorry, I gotta go back to. Like, just going back here just gives you a little sample of the different levels of metal mercury in consumed foods. What the next slide does it shows that those that the order in which they appear changes in the next slide because of the different life history of them occupying different. So, so species that are either living exclusively in the fresh water where the highest metal mercury contents are, like the lake trout will have the highest projected levels. Or the or or the birds that they prey on dead fish or other or eat other fish, they're gonna have the highest levels because of that 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 part of their life cycle. So therefore you see that eggs, tearing eggs, gull eggs, there will be reasonably changes. But the landlocked salmon there, but also if you look at the open at the at the Atlantic salmon here, it's it's very low. Why? Because they spend most of their life out in the ocean and they're not living in the metal, the elevated metal mercury waters. This is an important message for Inuit and all residents in Labrador. I mean, yes, and this is something that we need to do fairly consistently over the next ten years, is to communicate to people that eating country food there may be somewhat elevated metal mercury in it, but the nutritional value and cultural significance of eating that country food means that you really need to keep eating that country food. That I think now under this new agreement, I think a lot of these high levels won't be seen. Uh, fingers crossed, that's what we project. But even if we knew the message should be eat country food, it's good for you. And because we know what happens, there's lots of studies out there that show when you have consumption advisories, people move off country food, they rarely move back again when the consumption advisory is lifted, and there's nothing very nutritious, or the cost of food in these communities, the cost of nutritious food, means that really they can't afford to eat, to replace it sufficiently. Plus, as Billy Gauthier will eloquently tell you, about what eating country food for him means, both nutritionally and also for his cultural identity and lifestyle. Next slide. Next slide. So the last part here, I just wanted, and I'm down to the last couple of slides here. Um, so now what we want to do with the hair, and, so this is just looking at hair analysis. This is a baseline level for metal mercury as measured through mercury from hair standard procedures for Inuit. And we sampled, we took those samples, um, the period of hair sampling overlapped with two of the periods of the food uh, recall questionnaires and surveys. Because we wanted to make sure that we caught the relevant periods of time and we could link those together. So I think I would normally go through this slide very slowly and carefully because it's a, it's a real sciencey slide. Uh, but so I will do that here. But so excuse me if this is second nature to you to look at one of these. But I think it's worth doing it. And I did take out. I usually do this in steps, but I thought I, you guys have had your coffee. You can handle this. Um, so up here is the summer fall hair mercury concentrations, meaning that it covers those two periods. The population here represents 20% of the total Inuit population in, in the Lake Melville region. But the food survey has covered about 65% of the entire population. So this is a very large sample. And we need that large sample because we need to be getting these outliers here. These are the people most at risk, and we need to be able to understand what they're eating, how to protect them. Okay, just I'm going to keep keep your eyes on the left here. Work with me across the right of this diagram. So the simple uh, these are these are called um, what's the first word? Whisker plots. What's the first one? Box and whiskers plots. Sorry, I'm tired and I'm forgetting words. Mm -hmm. This is called a box and whisker plot. So the box here, the, the top and bottom of the box represents 25% to 75% of the population. 
So 50%, the middle 50% of the population falls into that box. The thick black line is the 50% point. So that's, you're literally that person in the middle, if you like. That's the median. That's the median. Okay. The whiskers, the top of the whisker is 95%. The bottom of the whisker, so the whisker I'm meaning for those on, on the phone, the is the dotted line, the, the little horizontals with the dashed line. The top is 95%, the bottom is 5%. And then the little circles at the top there are individual outliers beyond in that top 5% that we, as I mentioned earlier, we need to know who they are, not individually or personally, but we need to know what they're eating and, and, and sort of how they have those sorts of levels. So um, we can see the distinction between in gender here. So we probably understand that because males are eating more country food and we know that from those diets. If we look at the age, so these are the green plots going from less than 18 years of age to on the right, over 65. You can see that older people are eating more country food, which is probably something that we would also expect. So that's not the result of accumulation over lifespan. That's the result of what they're eating. Yes, because within, within it's, it's a re years. because there's a certain residency time for okay. methamphetamine. So it's really that's why we need that food recall. Right. Because you need to know what did they eat. In fact, we worked out. We asked them what had they eaten within the previous three months, one month, and one week. And your hair grows out. Yes. So you wouldn't see accumulating. Oh, right, it's hair. Yeah. yeah right. And we're just we're mm -hmm. this sample is from the ends. The couple, last couple of centimeters of the of, of the hair end. Right? Okay. And one last thing, the the scale, the vertical scale, the, the concentration of mercury at the log scale, right? Yes, that's another good point, and I, I uh, made that assumption or what I wouldn't in the community, but uh, I would try to explain that in the community because otherwise we would need a graph that goes up to the ceiling, right? To to, to be able to give that sort of projection. So right. when we're seeing there's a these people are way out there right. with respect to the concentration of hair mercury. So just for people on the phone, uh, the, the left, the, the y-axis, you can see it goes from 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 to 5. So we call that a log scale. It's obviously jumping in hundreds uh, in, uh, as it changes up there. So you need to be careful of that. So there is a big difference. Uh, because what we want to do is, in the diagram, catch those upper individuals. And where is the danger point? We'll talk about that in a second, yeah. So the last set I want to talk about here on the right is actually just accumulating people from the communities. So obviously we sample across Happy Valley Goose Bay, North West River, and Rigolet. And people in Happy Valley Goose Bay, we sample people who were identified as EU beneficiaries by the international government. So there was a very targeted recruitment in that sense to catch Inuit. You can see that, for instance, the general population levels are higher in Rigolet. People are eating more country food. And higher than Happy Valley Goose Bay in North West River because people are eating more country food. But it's interesting to see that some of the highest uh, outliers are from Happy Valley Goose Bay. So I don't want you to, to think that it doesn't, Happy Valley Goose Bay doesn't matter. There are people there who are eating lots of country food and maybe eating them from the river and near the upper part of Lake Melville where those concentrations may be, may be higher. Maybe a better way of saying that is they're eating country food that lives in those areas. As I said, drinking the water is not going to affect you eating the food that has the bioaccumulation of the methamphetamine in it. So they're eating more of the landlocked or the lake trout or the brook trout that are living almost exclusively in waters with high methamphetamine content, as we showed you on the previous slides. Next slide, please. This diagram um, shows you what, what what, is, what species are exposing people on the previous diagram to methyl mercury? So we know exactly what is, what is uh, driving that, those methyl mercury levels in humans. The delicious ones. <laughs> yeah. So 
67% of current metal mercury intake is from country foods. That is a remarkable number and probably higher than any other Aboriginal group studied, at least by the Harvard group and for what they even across North America. And not surprising, Aboriginal people in Labrador eat a lot of country food. And that is contributing a significant amount to that metal mercury load. So you can see that, um, you know, fresh salmon, cod, you can look at the different types of species, and of course we would have this for all of the 30, 40 species, what it's contributing. Uh, seal liver, gull eggs, tuna fish, that's store-bought, you can see, fish sticks. So, you, you know, you can see that cod, for instance, uh, and, and canned tuna is contributing significantly to people's metal mercury levels in the Upper Lake Melbourne region. Next slide. So what we did was we then modeled what would the metal mercury levels be according to the three scenarios in each individual based on knowing what they were eating where that country food was predominantly living in the different types of waters uh, to produce this diagram here. So the amount of work that has gone into producing the, the data in this diagram is pretty significant. So uh, once again, I need you to see that on the left-hand side, the x-axis, that is not a linear scale. It goes from 0 to 100 to 400 to 1500 because we want to catch these individuals at the top here who are going to experience a 15 times increase in the metal mercury uh, burden uh, projected from our data. Well, I think what's useful to know is if you look at the majority of people under the low scenario, there is going to be very little increase in metal mercury. That, I think, today, I would have been a lot more hesitant to tell you this on Friday, or, or more, more anxious to tell you about this on Friday because I, there was no mechanism to protect them. Today, this day, because of the agreement on Tuesday, I can tell you that we are working to, to create, this is the scenario, we now have the commitment from the provincial government that this will, or even better, will be the likely scenario for methyl mercury burden in Upper Lake Melville residents, and in Inuit, for Inuit in Upper Lake Melville. This potentially is what if NALCOR had its way, was what we were playing with, where you had 15 times increases in that and where the population itself, large parts of it experienced uh, increases. Uh, next slide. This is one that just tries to show you uh, how these increases fare against the Health Canada guidelines. I need you to be really wary of this diagram in many senses because guidelines exist for short periods of time. So you want to think about this. The, uh, the, epidemi well, the <laughs> epidemiology studies that have been done today which show that there's really no safe level. These guidelines typically in the US are 10 years behind those studies. So I can show you publications today that have been out for a year that shows there is no safe guideline. But it takes 10 years for the US EPA to actually build that into a new guideline. And it takes Health Canada another 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's not, it's, that's, that's actually reality in this case mm. because Elsie Sutherland worked for the EPA. She knows this in detail. So Health Canada guidelines are way out of date. But, uh, so what Tuesday has allowed us to do is not have the provincial government and alcohol sit comfortably on the Health Canada guideline. We can say that but the best science that informs the protection of Inuit health is these studies that have been done here, or even at best, it's the US EPA health guideline, not the Canadian one. And so I'm sure we're going to get lots of pushback from Health Canada on that. Um, so happily, you know, we're looking more at the light blue scenario here, which you can't even see on this on, on this block here for Happy Valley Goose Bay. You can see it right here. You can see it here for Rigolette. That, But it does show you that even under 
uh, currently today and under the light blue scenario, the, the low scenario, there will still be a certain percentage of people above the Health Canada guideline. And but I, I think um, there are a lot of Inuit communities across northern Canada which are at much higher levels than this. And they, through different approaches, are, are eating country food because the nutritional benefit is much greater than uh, any offset from metal mercury. And I can explain that a little bit more afterwards if you like. Uh, so really, so what I'm showing you here is we're broken down by communities. On the left is the projected population percentage above the Health Canada guideline. And we're broken it down by community, Happy Valley, Goose Bay, Northwest River, and Rigolet, and then by scenario. And so up until Tuesday, this may have been the scenario that people were living under, that more than 40% of that community would have exceeded the Health Canada guideline under that scenario. This is the significance of that agreement that was pushed on Tuesday. Wow. Next slide. I just want to, this is the last slide. We have life here. <laughs> it can be my last slide. I, one more. Where am I with time? It's it 12 o'clock. So I'm lying again. Yeah, I might be lying again. Just, I just wanted to point this out because in over the summer, the Minister Trimper accepted the Human Health Risk Assessment Plan of NALCORS, even though the, the, the national government complained and wrote out a five page document explaining what was wrong with it. I need to just, if you, if you need to go before I finish this slide, here's the key message. That the NALCOR's human health risk assessment can make no conclusion about the risk to Inuit health. It does not have, it was never designed to do that and has not got the ability to do that. So I want you just simply to compare. Uh, it was built, that plan was built by Golder Associates, conducted by them. So our study sampled over a thousand Inuit in Nick Melville. They did 293 participants in total of all people, including in Labrador City, hmm. upstream of Muskrat Falls, <laughs> and also people <laughs> downstream. Right. If you look at the if you look at the component that addresses Inuit, all of ours are Inuit on the left, on the right. This is the 66% were Aboriginal, so that could be Inu, Métis, or Inuit. Uh, and therefore, really, because of the small sample size spread across those Aboriginal groups, they can't say anything about an individual group. They can say something maybe about Aboriginal groups in general, but that's spread across a whole range of communities as well, and even upstream of Muskrat Falls. Uh, you can see the diet survey. They also did a diet survey and hair samples. I should add with my comment from the last, they did not sample anybody in Rigolet because the Nazi government wouldn't allow them. They were already they were already participating in the Nazi government study, and there was that fear that Nalcor is going to come in and ask them people to do the exact same thing again, take more hair samples. So once again, you know, the, uh, so I need to have that. Caution there. Next slide. Next one. We did three seasons in the one year 2014. We repeated this oh, to catch the effects of different country food. The, the Golder Associates or Nalco Energy Study did it in the winter only when the consumption of country foods is at its lowest. And therefore, the potential exposure was at its lowest. Next slide. Uh, on the right, I think it says that all no conclusions can be made about Inuit specific future exposure of those most vulnerable. Because what we know is that Inuit are those most vulnerable to the people who eat country food and practice a traditional lifestyle are the ones most vulnerable to metal mercury exposure. And they cannot, their plan can say nothing about those. And so we want to make sure that the monitoring plan looks not just at metal mercury in the water or metal mercury in the country food. We want a monitoring program for human health for Inuit and others living in Upper Lake Melville. It perhaps is an opt-in program, but if we want to alleviate the fears of people, if we want to uh, strengthen their, their confidence in their food supply, 
then we need to give them the option that they can actually uh, look at the, their own mental mercury levels in health. And we have, we have the community researchers in place that did this study still available to be able to do that work. So it's Inuit sampling Inuit to assess Inuit health. I mean, that is the, that has to be a cornerstone of any community monitoring. I th I'm, and I'm finished there. I'm going to well, leave that, that as wonderful. the last slide. Well, thank you so much. Now I have to stop. For the so we have a few minutes for questions. Sorry.